I started to watch this TV series called Your Honor. I recommend you check that out. Um, that's pretty interesting. Um, it stars the guy. <clears throat> is it Brian Cranston? Um, the dude from Breaking Bad. He's really good in it. And essentially, the whole premise behind it is, um, this kid, um, accident. What? Well, so I give the plot away. Yeah, I give it because it's, it's part of the movie. But again, if you don't want any spoilers, then make sure you click excellence video in five, four, three, two, one. So the plot of the TV series essentially, Brian Cranston's son, um, gets involved in a hit and run accident where he, un, you know, inadvertently kills, um, this kid. The kid happens to be the son of a very powerful mob boss or criminal of, you know, under underlord or whatever overlord, whatever they called in whatever area that they live in um the breaking bad dude's son or the breaking bad dude he's obviously a judge but they're not exactly rich or affluent in any way shape or form they're kind of middle of the road middle class people and he's well known to be a little bit of a you know wouldn't say what is he, he he's known to be a little bit charitable in, in the sentencing he gets very invested in the people that he speaks that come into his courtroom he goes out of his way it seems like to be a little bit more lenient to people who come from you know rough neighborhoods and rough backgrounds and then you know as the story kind of evolves he has to kind of you know um he has to push those boundaries and limits that he's willing to do in order to keep his son safe because as we learn in the series unfortunately um his wife and the mother of his child has essentially passed away early so he's left to look after this young teenage kid on his own as he's going through such a traumatic experience like you know inadvertently killing somebody and he's growing up in front of his eyes so it's a pretty cool premise and i love the fact that you know both families are from what you would expect what you'd kind of attribute to well to do you know have pretty good um support systems around them whatever it may be right that that's a judge that guy's a criminal overlord everyone obviously is kissing the ring and making sure that they keep him happy and everything because they're scared um the family obviously have some clout and influence in the town there's a lot of kind of clashing things and then of course there's a lot of collateral damage that you basically see as the series goes on but it's really good just the opening sequence alone the first 20 minutes will get you gripped it's a very very strong first um episode i think the, the first two episodes are out i'm pretty sure the third one came out the other day but if you have struggling to watch something i definitely recommend you check out your honor um what else did i watch um, i finished the undoing that was pretty good um a bit upset about the ending i thought they would have tried a bit more to really kind of throw you for a loop i think you know in the end the killer made complete sense but i would have still preferred all the other threads that they sort of like threw out there the little bits of bait um the little clues i would have thought i would have i would have liked there to be more exploration there um that kind of went nowhere what i did like about it which I think was expertly done was the complete and utter destruction of this woman's life, right? Nicole Kidman's character. Um, you get, you see it from the start, right? This very like, you know, super, you know, a type woman, highly intelligent, um, very career driven, but assured, um, a great balance between career and family, which is, you know, something if you watch a lot of these TV things, um, that center around women is usually a common trope that they kind of struggle to balance the two things which maybe is a um your representative of their kind of real life but in this aspect you see somebody that's very accomplished in their career but also has a very steady um home life and has the extra bonus of having a pretty vibrant sex life it appears like right they have you know they kind of are all over each other like teenagers she's got a really you know um, humorous but parental sort of uh, relationship with her young teenage son um you know she's kind of uh, has a good social group a social circle that she surrounds herself in where she's you know she's not subordinate to these women but she's also uh very highly valued in that group like very very good right it's all done really really expertly expertly done and then over this the course of like what is it six episodes her life comes crashing down in really dramatic fashion every single thread gets pulled and i love the fact that even that i, I love it even more that they um nicole kidman's character is extremely wealthy right her family whoever the, the that it gets up to we don't really get to find out in a series but they're extremely wealthy they have all the resources um that you would you would kind of wish for if you ever get put in a situation that she got put in 
But as it transpired, you know, in actual real life, as it actually happens, there's not a man, there's no amount of money that's going to inoculate you from the hurt and the sort of betrayal and the loneliness that she feels going through, especially more so social group and how she gets ostracized. Because, you know, I'm assuming, especially when you're well to do and you're affluent and you go, you, your kids attend a private school, there is a little, you know, community, I'd imagine, amongst parents, right? Because they mostly, you know, people that come from, again, um, come from uh uh come from means they obviously have influence and all this sort of stuff and you know these people probably are not the most trusting people in the world so you kind of um allow yourself you know to lower your guard somewhat because the people that are in that school you'd assume for the most part are from a certain you know cultural bracket a certain scene whatever it may be so you you probably um leave yourself open to making friends very fairly quickly especially if you're like a socialite mum that doesn't really do anything right you just spend the riches of your um you know workaholic husband or whoever it may be or your donor so you're probably lonely you're looking for some sort of connection so imagine it, not in not in Nicole Kidman's character because she seems to be a little bit more well adjusted but in general I love the fact that they kind of superimpose that character you know with a wealthy background instead of them being working class I think it kind of hit more that way because in our heads we're thinking oh she can deal with this easily right um she can spin the story in this press she can make it seem like she wasn't involved she can make you know she can whatever it may be but it doesn't work out that way and I love the scene where she sort of gets ostracized from her group of friends and it happens in a very slow methodical way it's sort of like you know weird looks as you're about to go up to the gate um you know a bit of distance pulling away people kind of being short with you in conversations and just loads of whispering and kind of looks I love it man and you you kind of felt the coldness kind of seep all over her right she just felt suddenly you just feel a bit chilly you start kind of covering yourself in your chest and sort of wanting to disappear under your hood oh and her coats as well nicole kidman's outfits in the entire series are really well done i actually prefer the outfit you know to, to be fair, preference wise the outfits of her friend the closest friend that she has who's a sort of who's a lawyer as well or a pr person um they absolutely decked her out to the night and she looked really good whoever did the costume design um for that tv series deserves a lot of credit but really good series man the undoing i really really enjoyed it again i would i wish the ending was a bit different um the not again the annoying thing that they always do the kid in the undoing is an absolute he's he pisses me off especially towards you know as you go towards the end of the series just like what are you doing it's what happens though, isn't it like it's like the kid in the sopranos isn't it like your dad is a murderous mob boss do you know what i mean like i'm sorry that you can't attend your baseball games do you know what i mean like stop crying like <laughs> it's just insane like sometimes you think about these things but you know i guess they try to you know make it seem as realistic as possible you'd imagine if you were a kid would you really know what your dad was getting up to maybe not i don't know but regardless it was just funny to see how needy the kid was for his dad knowing full well that his dad's been accused of flipping murder <laughs> and he's on the run it was just like what is wrong with this child but they always seem to do that they always seem to have like an annoying kid i think even in ozarks the first you know few seasons of it first two or maybe it was the first season i'm not too sure but the kids were really annoying right even more so than the wife they were doing everything in their power to like you know snitch on their parents so it's like what are you doing you know if you snitch on your parents you're gonna go into flipping you know you're gonna go into care this isn't gonna end well for you you know you're not gonna become a tiktok star <laughs> you're gonna go into some sort of you know um housing system or family you know family system that you probably don't want to be in especially from that sort of background but you know it hooks you in but yeah recommend check out the undoing um that was really good i really enjoyed that what else did i watch oh yeah i watched a comedy store documentary that was superb um more so because i'm a you know of course as you guys are aware listening and watching this uh podcast you know that i talk about sometimes a lot about the la comedy scene and you know the stuff that goes on in there and i'm a big fan of it i've kind of got my introduction via i'm gonna sort of say joe rogan back in the day but i sort of branched out listened to a lot of bill burr tim dylan joey diaz danish you know neil Tom Segura in your mum's house, um, Theo Vaughan, of course, Tiger Belly, all these people. And the common denominator that sort of runs through them, the common theme, Arisha Fear, of course, Skeptic Tank, Duncan Trussell, um, loads of those guys, right? I listen to most of their podcasts um, here and there. Um, 
but the common thing that runs between all of them is the comedy store, right? It's like it's synonymous with that scene. And you hear a lot about it. You hear them tell really cool stories. You see some pictures, but you don't necessarily get the vibe of it. And I think the good, the best thing that this documentary did, I'm going to get here on the screen, is that it provided you a bit of context as to why the comedy store means so much to these people. Um, it's directed by this guy. What's his name? Mike Binder. Is it Binder? Whatever his name is. Let me find it here. Mike Binder, yeah. He's a former comedian himself, but now he's a director. And he put this together, and it was such a good way to kind of... Um, again, documentaries aren't going to be, you know, they're not autobiographical, autogo autobiographical, right? And they're not, you know, 100% based on fact. It's just one person's perception of the events that happened during that time, especially when he's weaving together loads of different people's perspective. But I think he did a really good way of charting and kind of documenting the inception of the comedy store all the way to what we kind of know of it now. And um, I think I heard somebody, some of those comedians, one of them kind of criticism they said about the documentary was that it didn't really highlight what's actually going on now. Um, again, I think that was a bit unfair because I think it's hard for Mike Banner to do that because from what I've read in between the lines, he's not really been present in the comedy store himself throughout the last few years, right? Only in maybe the last decade or so, he's been kind of popping in here and there. But for the most part, he sort of moved on from the comedy store. And he saw a lot of that. He saw a lot of really big Hollywood stars who I wouldn't say they sort of like, I was surprised to see them in the, in the documentary because I'd never really heard them speak openly about the comedy store. It was more so like, hey, it was more so the director saying, hey, did you know this person came from here as opposed to that person telling you that's where they came from? Of course, the stand-up comedians are, are all right, but I think some of the movie star guys, they're a little bit, you kind of get the feeling that, you know, they used the comedy store as a launch pad in order to do the thing they really wanted to do, which is be an actor or whatever it may be. Um, nowadays, it's a bit different, right? Because obviously, um, with, especially with podcasting, you essentially have your own sort of uh, TV show-ish kind of thing that you can do there. Um, and then, of course, you can just concentrate on being funny and not trying to get on SNL and not trying to get a TV deal. It's a bit different. So maybe that's why it changed. But I would have liked to have seen a bit more owners placed on the now the newer generation and what they're kind of going through i still did like those episodes i think towards the end where they sort of spoke about how hard it is to get spots there the open mic night um they obviously spoke to the new booker um and his perspective and how he chooses people um really that was all really cool um but again there was a lot of harking back to the old times but in general the common thing that i really liked about it i'm gonna click it the common thing that i really liked about it was that it reminded me a lot about why residencies and why hubs and why like places that the comedy store are important in all creative fields especially i'm going to say like you know electronic music of course that the the scene that i'm mostly interested in there's not like there really isn't a lot of these sort of places right in this world oh, there really isn't a lot of these sort of places that exist in the scene now in electronic music that's a real problem issue i have as well especially in london um they don't really we have a sort of residency sort of culture but not really it's something that i kind of see a lot more in mainland europe especially in places like germany and berlin right they seem to have or even frankfurt robert johnson they seem to have it figured out where they have like a place where a set amount of people can play um most of the time during the months right on most weekends um they obviously give them priority as well during the new year's eve which one of their biggest nice it's all residents playing for the most part and it's just a way for you to kind of hone your craft develop your sound play to an obviously a rapturous and really intrigued and devoted fan base and they kind of remind me a little bit of the um what you call it uh that Leibowitz woman quote where she says something like um from a documentary that um so people always talk about you know the great artists that we lost during the AIDS, AIDS epidemic you know back in the days but she said the the other thing people don't really understand is we also lost a lot of like really nuanced and um aware and you know culture you know smart uh consumers who were really used to high level creative arts and practitioners so whenever a bullshit person came along they were able to kind of sift them out really quickly but when you lost a great artist and you lost the discerning consumers all a lot of shit was able to kind of pop up from the woodwork so i think that's what you got from the documentary as well you got this idea that not only were the comedians at a really high level at that time and they're all pushing each other and it was a breeding ground for talent and all this sort of stuff and they had a criteria to get in and you had to bring your best work all this sort of you know thing that happened there was also i felt like just as much there was just as much quality in the audience too of people that were willing to go to this club in the middle of nowhere and essentially pay a ticket to go see you know people that they hadn't really heard of who were just kind of getting started in the industry you know who kind of like you know had their um training wheels on i think that was really cool 
maybe because maybe it's different now because you hear people talk about all the time, especially Joe, about how many killers are performing on you know the comedy store on any given night. So there's probably not as much opportunity for a young and up and coming person to develop their act and all that sort of bloody blah blah blah. But I, I did really feel a little bit like man. I'm jealous that they have a spot like this that exists, right? Where they're just able to just have number one, the best people in the scene playing um, or performing so on stage, and also an opportunity for the the newer generation to also get a chance to play on that same stage. That's the thing that I think. Like, where in London, I can't think of many big or like culturally relevant. Um, you know the places that everyone rates where they also book like the best DJs and they also give people up and coming a chance to play on that same stage it doesn't necessarily happen that's the issue I have sometimes um, and again I don't think I don't think that's ever going to change I think we're so obsessed here with you know ticketed events and you know headliners all this sort of bullshit that promoters are probably worried about booking people not known because you're not going to move tickets and then punters are worried of not going to a night they don't know who's playing and it's going to be shit there's a lot of you know and then also if you're a punter and you pay 50 quid for a night full of residents and the club's only open until one you're kind of stuck there in it there's no else you can go for the most part so I get the I get the I get the kind of um, limitations that are there, but I would like to be a bit more owner's place on that because you did see the fruits of labor with the comedy store allowing, you know, both people of both subsets of groups of kind of creatives to kind of, you know, develop their act at the same time on the same platform. Of course, varying times, obviously if you're more experienced and you're better, you just get the peak hours and all that sort of good stuff. And, you know, that was already uh, political, but I did get a lot of insight into why the comedy store is so important and, you know, why I think more than likely, you know, once the pandemic is over and they end up kind of recalling Governor Newsom, which they're doing now at the moment, which is mad. But I think once the COVID is over, I do think the comedy store will rise again. I think there'll be a new generation of people in there, maybe a changing of the guard because so many people have left LA, some people have been cancelled, blah, blah, blah. But I do think they, it will rise again. Um, I think it's just it's just ingrained in LA. It's grained in the comedy scene. There's no way that that, that place can ever die. I don't think it will even live on far. It will, I think it will even live on, um, you know, even if the building isn't around anymore. I think that's how much um, uh, cultural capital is kind of got vested in LA. It's like, I don't know, I just feel it, like watching a documentary. Again, I've been there already. So now watch the documentary and having a bit insight of people that used to be there, it definitely kind of opened my eyes on it. But I definitely recommend if you're a fan of the LA comedy scene, you want to get an understanding as to why these guys are so intolerable when they're talking about the comedy store, watch this documentary. It will definitely give you an insight and appreciation on it. And it'll maybe um, answer some lingering doubts and questions you had as to why these guys are always kind of leaving their families and going to perform for fifteen dollars uh, whatever it may be that they kind of get paid when they're on there but definitely check it out man it's really amazing oh and again um mitzi shaw oh, what a what a legend man the the role that she played in kind of cultivating that entire scene um the role she played in some people's careers you know the point that she gave them some unhinged some really enlightening you hear the stories a lot especially from joe diaz but um again someone that doesn't really get i don't say the credit that she deserves we don't really hear her getting spoken about as much and especially with this whole like you know onus on promoting um you know uh, people from diverse backgrounds whether they be women or people of different color you would assume that somebody like her who was able to somehow manage a madhouse of you know what psychopathic narcissistic um you know insecure uh stand-up comedians on varying levels of success mixed with all the jealousy and bitterness that ha happens in a scene when people are popping and not popping i don't know how she did it man like i don't know really don't know how she did it. i'm sure there were some you know bumps along the way but to keep that madhouse in check and to do what she did with it and to play that much of a pivot to ruin people's career like she deserves a lot more flowers man a lot more flowers again i'm not sure i wonder if she has a star in hollywood i wonder if she has a star i don't know if she does but she should she should have a, she should have a star a statue something commemorating her contribution to the arts because without me she's showing the comedy store i don't know if a lot of these people would be where they are now at the moment that we know and love man like it was you hear a lot of people speaking about how it was something to aim for the comedy store right it was kind of like their you know i don't know their madison square garden in some respect right that was the a league you went to be alongside your you know the best people in the business that's where you went um really cool and they speak about the Carlsman Sia stuff with Joe Rogan that's really awesome um he um kind of speaks about it really well the fact that he kind of it's mad to think they picked Carlsman Sia over Joe Rogan in that episode isn't it maddening but of course during that time I'm assuming Carlsman Sia was probably you know he was um 
Harden, what do you call it? Harden Grace or whatever they call it. Is that the term that's people use? Whatever it is. But he was hot shit back then, innit? So I can imagine they're, they're being put in a bit of a bind, right? This dude is essentially putting bums in seats for real. And then, you know, there's this other guy who, you know, you don't really know what's going on or a story's true or not. And I'd imagine a lot of that to do as well with the fact that, because Joe's the, I won't say that he was a, I guess because he hadn't, he didn't have as much to lose as the others. Um, he could, even though it was hurtful to get kicked out of the comedy store, he could go and restart his comedy career in another club. It wasn't that detrimental, but I'm assuming, you know, especially with how hierarchical call um, the art side in some respects, the higher you get up, the more, you know, people try and big time you. Comedy is just so scared, isn't it? They're just worried. They just wanted to keep their spot. They didn't want to get taken off. So they just wouldn't make any noise about him um, copying or taking jokes. Well, not even copying. He would just steal them, innit? He would just outright steal the jokes and do them in front of the comedian themselves. Absolutely nutty guy. But that was a mad how that ended. And I think Carson is still doing stand-up now. I'm pretty sure. But he's just doing it on his own little circuit. You know, fans are still um, go out and see the stuff that he's done, which must be difficult to deal with knowing that, you know, because you hear that a lot because even i would imagine in every in every scene in every kind of subculture you kind of want the acknowledgement and the respect of your peers and that's probably more important to you than the actual adoration of fans i think in some respect right especially peers that you rate so i can imagine how lonely and um yeah just how lonely it must be to be cosmic see to still have a somewhat decent career but have no comedy and f have no like you know actual comedians that you respect friends that will vouch for you that will have you on their show that will you know uh, except for bobby lee i don't really hear anyone speak highly about him and bobby lee you know he's got the backbone of a you know <laughs> of kitchen roll do you know what i mean he's not the best guy to use an example but yeah man it must be so weird and then to see how both of their careers have sort of um yeah evolved over time it's a bit it's a, it must be hard to take if you're a customer see mate at one point you was you know so up your own ass that you you thought stealing jokes and doing what you wanted there was no consequences to it and you you know thought this you know meathead in joe rogan was some any guy and then roland 10 to 20 years later he's you know insanely wealthy insanely culturally irrelevant you know be better than ever in stand-up and then you are doing whatever he's doing you know performing to whatever crowd he's performing to like shit must be horrible must be horrible but again I mean, at least he's got a career in it i guess the, it, it it could be worse it could be just not doing comedy at all but yeah recommend you check it out the comedy store is available on showtime i think but you know if you know where to watch things you can watch things um it's a, definitely a, a really good documentary um i really really enjoyed it and again it showed me why all these guys are so obsessed with the comedy store <laughs>